today after 39 years another historic judgment by the supreme court has ensured that there will be no other shahbano in this country a bench of justice bb nagratna and justice ag masi dismissed a muslim man's petition challenging a higher court order to pay maintenance to his divorced wife under crpc section 125 he had claimed that a muslim woman must abide by the muslim personal law where alimony or maintenance uh, is uh, only paid within 3 months uh, of uh, the iddat period the supreme court has ruled that section 125 of the crpc a secular law can be invoked by muslim women to claim alimony hello everyone i'm raisa i'm here on behalf of the foundation for democratic reforms today we have with us dr jp welcome sir hello raisa uh, sir recently the supreme court um, held a ruling holding the validity of the section 125 of the crpc act uh, it's also raised a lot of memories of the shabanu case back in 1985 so to begin with why is this judgment relevant and when it did take place back then what momentum or what questions did it arise Reser, I think this is something that we should all rejoice in, because whatever be the flaws in our society and politics, one very positive aspect has been for the past seventy-five years after independence, seventy-six years, and even during the freedom struggle, our national movement and our constitutional democracy are inseparably linked with modernizing our society. Indians, no, most Indians are God-fearing. 99 percent of Indians probably nowhere on earth do you have so many people who genuinely believe in God. Of course, your choice, whatever be the faith, and that is their choice. I am an agnostic. I am in a hopeless minority in India, but it's their choice. But in modernizing religion, in removing the unhealthy practices, superstition, discrimination of women against women, or discrimination on grounds of caste by birth. these are some of the most heinous practice some of the terrible hindu practices like child marriage earlier even before independence sati and the woman was burnt on the funeral pyre of the husband these are terrible practices by any by any standard the prohibition of widow remarriage a widow becoming a permanent slave of the family all these are terrible practices in the name of faith and religion one good thing about indian society and state is consistently in the past 75 76 years indian society and state have rebelled against these and there is not a single progressive law eliminating these bad practices of religion which has not been unanimously approved in parliament in this country we should feel proud no there is much to criticize our politics take for instance the uh, abortion rights of women even today in america this is a big debate one of the biggest issues in the current election the presidential election in the country and congressional election is women's right to abortion whereas in india reproductive rights were respected in 1971 by law medical termination of pregnancy act without a fuss we enacted it there is not a single group that protest against it then or now and quietly without a fuss in an illiterate country in a poor country women who feel the need to to terminate pregnancy are doing it lawfully and safely without any fear without any problem and that shows you the contrast between many other societies otherwise very progressive in indian society and state so we must be grateful to our political system and the political parties they have acted on the whole very well but in a rare exception in 1986 rajiv gandhi government which all powerful with 415 or so mps it lost its now what happened was under section 125 of the crpc the old crpc now 144 section 144 of the new crpc called bharatiya nagarika uh, whatever samhita <laughs> forget the the full name of it basically this says that if a, a wife who is divorced or separated or a minor child your own child or your aged parents they need financial support they don't have any means of livelihood and if you have means the law has been very very fair if they have no means and if you have means then it is your duty to support them within reasonable limits how is it wrong your own child which you spawned as long as the child is a minor and without any means who will take care of the child 
your wife with whom you lived and you agreed to live for a lifetime, for whatever reason, you divorced, who will take care of her? Unless she is married or something, that's a different matter. Or unless she has her own means. Or your own aged parents who took care of you all through their life, sacrificed so much for you, when they need you, if you don't take care of them, who will take care of you? So the law says, in such a case, it's your responsibility to take care of them. If you don't take care of them, then you can go to, the, the people agreed can go to a court. Court will then, after examining the issue, give an order, asking you to pay monthly maintenance for them. It's a perfectly reasonable thing. You should not require actually a court of law to do that. But in one case, a Muslim woman who was divorced, and in those days, remember, triple talaq means a husband could divorce at will. The woman has no role also in that. And she was poor, indigent. And the husband had the means. The court ordered a small amount, if I remember rightly, some 175 rupees or something per month. A small amount was ordered. Obviously, it is not the husband who took the matter to the higher courts. The whole orthodox clergy who wanted to perpetuate the heinous practices and oppression of oppression of women, they, in the name of Islam, they took the matter to High Court and Supreme Court. Supreme Court upheld it, in the famous Shabano case. Then, the enlightened sections of Muslims, the modernist Muslims all supported it. Arif Muhammad Khan, who is now governor of Kerala, he was a minister in the Union government, he was a minister of state in the Home Ministry, a young rising star among Muslim politicians from UP. He would have easily become the Prime Minister of India and or the President of India in this country because he had the stature, the ability, the competence, the integrity, etc. He raised in protest. He said, this must be preserved. This is a good judgment. We must not undo it just because some uh, obscurantist elements are uh, fighting against it. Abid Hussain, a former IAS officer from Hyderabad, for instance, uh, he was also a member of the Planning Commission. He was uh, ambassador to the United States, one of the most respected intellectuals in the Muslim community of India. He opposed, many people opposed, 105 people, eminent Muslims who wrote a letter against, uh, against any change. But unfortunately, the government yielded to the pressure from the obscurantist elements. They enacted a law, Muslim Women's Law in 1986, which basically said, as per Islamic law, they didn't mention Islamic law, but basically the content, iddat, for a period of three months after the divorce, you have to take care of your wife, that's all. No matter how poor she is, no matter whether she is starving or what. Children, if she is pregnant until the child is born, and for two years of their life. After two years, what happens? Your own children. That is the law. Such a bad law was enacted. Now the Supreme Court has basically said, irrespective of that law, the provisions of CRPC 125 section then, 144 section now, that is the need to maintain your estranged wife. If she needs, needs support and if you have the means, is universal. You can't discriminate between Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Parsis, Sikhs and Jains. Everybody must get the same treatment. It's a human rights issue, women's rights issue. I think the court is absolutely right. The government at the time was wrong. And unfortunately, that bad decision of 1986 had lasting and bad consequences to India's polity. As I said, it's probably one of the few instances where the, the parliament enacted badly on these issues. Indian parliament across the spectrum has been always unanimous in supporting progressive legislation against caste discrimination, in favor of women's rights, in favor of children's rights, in favor of everything humane our parliament has been consistently upholding. For once they yielded to political pressure. And because of that, there was a lot of outrage in society. Rajiv Gandhi therefore tried to overcompensate. He tried to appease now the Hindu sentiment. And therefore they got opened the Babri Masjid lock. The Babri Masjid gates were locked from 1947 to 1986 uh, or 87. For 41, 42 years it was locked. It was opened with the government's intervention to appease the, the Hindu sentiment. The Home Minister Bhuta Singh was sent to Ayodhya to do Shilanyas, the foundation ceremony for the Ram Temple. Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi launched his election campaign in 1989 from Ayodhya. Now, if Congress does it, why will BJP stay behind? BJP is overtly, publicly dedicated to unifying Hindu society and promoting the, the good ancient values that they believe in. And therefore, they took up the whole Ramjan movement and greater communalization of politics happened that way. 
So this has a very unhappy history. And it's a good thing that the Supreme Court upheld the constitutional secular norm, transcending religious uh, superstition. It's not religious faith, it's superstition or bad practices. In every religion, there are wonderful things about faith. There are terrible things about bad practices. Caste system in Hinduism, the sati, women, the, the widow being burnt on the funeral pyre of their husband, or the widow's, uh, widow marriage being prohibited, child marriage being a norm. All these are terrible practices. Now, you cannot use religion as a shield to protect those evil practices at the cost of modernization, at the cost of liberty of large section, sections of the population. Mm -hmm. So we must be very clear where religion is sacrosanct and state will not interfere, where in the name of religion certain practices are not allowed, we cannot condone, we must stop that. Mm -hmm. And that line once again is clearly brought out by the Supreme Court judgment. Yes, sir. So like we discussed this judgment or this case back then of course had relevance in terms of how modern or progressive it was when it came to religion but also the political impact that it had or how it highlighted the political landslide that took place after that. In that context, what is the role of political impulse when it comes to causing social fractions and what really is the state of, what is really the role of the state when it comes to religion? No, I think it's a good question. We have, we have dualism practiced in India. On the one hand, the constitutional edicts are very clear. It's a very humane, very secular, very modernist constitution. Constitutional values are extremely progressive. And even the state's actions in terms of law and legislation are extremely progressive. We are one of the most progressive. I mentioned to you the Medical Termination of Pregnancy Act. Many Western societies with hundreds of years of democracy and culture and civilization and education behind them are now completely in turmoil about women's right to abortion, for instance. India did not have any problem. Our political system was completely united and our society was completely united. There's not one single item of protest in the country. I feel very proud about our country with all our imperfections. So that is one part. There is another part which makes our politics very, very demonic, extremely negative. Because of the desperate need to go to identity politics to fashion them into vote banks. Because the link between the vote and the consequences in individual's life is missing in our country, in the people's minds, because they're not able to satisfy the electorate because we have failed to govern well. The political parties, because they have to go back to people again and again and again to get a mandate, they found caste and religion as easy means of mobilizing people. Sadly, in India today, both caste and religion are, in fact, the single most important or the two most important uh, platforms for mobilization for politics. It's a terrible thing. Political mobilization will be based on ideas, on ideals, on goals, on agendas, on dreams and aspirations, not origin, not social groups. It should be about rights of individuals and the responsibilities of individuals and the state's responsibilities and what you expect from the tax money. Instead, if caste identity and religious identity become the, the ways of uh, mobilizing vote, then politicians feel tempted because the stakes for power are so great. India, our, our political competition is so fierce. Our elections are so competitive, probably more competitive than anywhere else on earth. For many politicians, elections are about life or death. It's not about getting people's mandate to serve the public cause as per their wish. No, it's a life or death. If I get elected, I am the Sultan or the Emperor or the King. If I don't get elected, then my life is finished. Death is preferable to that. That's the level to which we have come. There's one man in Telangana who contested the election saying that if you don't elect me, I will commit suicide. Mm -hmm. And people elected him. I mean, whether you have to laugh at it or cry, I don't know. That if you reduced politics to that level of life or death level, so in that climate, the constitutional values and your general political conduct and support of reform movements is completely given the go-by and you appease the most obscurantist sentiments. And it is a part of that that happened in 86. But generally otherwise, I would still say with all imperfections, our, our political system and society are moving towards modernity with relatively less friction compared to many other societies. But obviously, this propensity for mobilization on grounds of caste and religion and the propensity to act in a manner detrimental to larger human rights 
and the propensity for triumphalism mm. to put down the other group and try to humiliate them, these are extremely detrimental to public good and democracy and we have to be very, very watchful. So when we talk about something as subjective as religion, to what extent can principles of egalitarianism or secularism hold up to that? And what is the difference between group rights and individual rights? How must we view I it? I think there are two great questions. Uh, first, let's take group rights and individual rights. Uh, Reza, constitution and the modern state are about the individual versus the state. What are the freedoms? If you look at the constitutional language of freedom, fundamental rights also, the state shall not, shall not, shall not. Basically, they are imposing limits on the state's power over your individual freedom. So what is the ratio? Just as good religions do the same thing, or good religious practices do that, it is basically finding a, a, a reconciliation between individual freedom and collective good. Basically, the state shall not interfere in your sphere of liberty, personal liberty, unless, what is it unless? The exceptions given in Article 19, one or other articles of the Constitution, reasonable restrictions as we call. What are the reasonable restrictions? Essentially to protect the community. And if you don't understand that, that fundamentally laws and liberty are about individuals essentially. On occasion groups you have to look at them, depending on the socio-economic context. For instance, you cannot ignore the caste and caste oppression. Therefore, as caste we have to give some protection. But the primary accent is individual liberty. Ultimately, it's about individuation. From groups to most more individuals. But if you are in a primitive political state, you tend to view everything as a group issue. Afghanistan is an extreme form. They have what are called loya jargas. What is the loya jarga? The tribal councils. It's all about the tribe. It's not about the individual rights. It's not about your future, your aspirations. It's about the tribe. Now, you cannot reduce our parliament into a loya jarga. But at the same time, given the context of socio-economic realities, we must respect the group rights. For instance, your right to practice a religion. You must never stop that. You must never interfere with that. For instance, the, the rights anyway are guaranteed, but the, the prevention of oppression of certain castes, untouchability. So you are now specifically targeting the state action in favor of certain discriminated groups to uh, eliminate untouchability. And you are doing something more positive, positive discrimination. Reservations is one form. But the fundamental overarching issue is individual must be able to flourish. Otherwise, if it becomes a larger guy eventually, it becomes only a, a, a cabal of tribes or castes or religious groups, forgetting the individual. And we have seen the pain of oppression of individuals Kaap panchayats, take caste for instance. If we give too much importance to caste, what are Kaap, Kaap panchayats? What are caste panchayats? What is this communication from a caste religion? These are all oppressive to human rights in the name of religious practice or a caste practice. So that fine balance must be maintained very carefully. Now the second question you raised, now I forget the question. What extent can egalitarianism or secularism be held when ah. religion is as subjective? So, are there limits to state action? Mm -hmm. To what extent can state actually reform society? I think it's a, it's a very great question and I don't think many people have still figured out the answer. We want to do many things. We desire many things. But state must decide what we can do, not what we want to do. There's a difference between what you desire and what you realistically can accomplish. State is not God. We don't want a God in the name of state. We have our own gods or demons. We don't need another God or demon in the state. State is an entity created by us for collective good. State has therefore limited power, limited resources. If the state focuses on everything under the sun in the name of desirability or individual whims, that state becomes ineffective. Therefore, even in the name of reform, you must use your judgment to decide where I should stop. Take, for instance, an example, the Catholic priesthood. Typically, Catholic priesthood is limited to males. Women, even if they want to, they cannot be. 
I think nowadays there are some reform movements. Occasionally, women priests are ordained. To what extent the papacy, the supreme pontiff of the Catholic religion, approves, I am not familiar. But I am making a broader statement. Now, supposing in this anxiety to protect the women's rights, a legislature says women should be ordained as Catholic priests, I think you crossed the line. In your scheme of things as a human being, it may be desirable. Why should there be any difference? But is it fundamentally important for the human rights in that group? Is non-ordaining as priests offending women's rights at a fundamental level? Is it oppressing them? Is it causing them harm? I think the ratio is clear. So by overarching intervention, when it's not warranted, you're making only the state weak and impotent, and you're only creating animosity. Take, for instance, the case of Supreme Court uh, direction about the uh, entry of women into the Sabarimalai temple. To me, it's, uh, uh, or to any reasonable individual, it's, it's absolutely unacceptable that women are not allowed to worship in a, in a way they like. So if women want to go to Sabarimalai, they should, they should be able to go. That is what is desirable. But is it central to women's rights? Is it so important that the state power should be exercised there? In this case, state power is exercised in the form of a court judgment. What is the outcome? To the best of my understanding, only two women are so visited. There was protest in the community that they don't want it. And ultimately, you have to give it up. So you only exhibited the state's incapacity. You have not really advanced human liberty. Whereas the same power, there are so many things wrong in dealing with women in our society or other groups in our society, which are much more doable and necessary because there is a real violence cost against women in some form or other. And that's where we should focus on. So what is desirable versus what is feasible, what is pragmatic is very important because it's a very complex theme, law, social change, where the society will go first or law should go. Ideally, they should go together. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the law should force the pace of change even against the society's whims and norms. But only when it is obnoxious, mm -hmm. it is heinous, it's not acceptable to our notions of modernity. Mm -hmm. It's violating at a very fundamental level the rights of that, that group, mm -hmm. not otherwise. Otherwise, the state becomes overarching, mm -hmm. all-encompassing, totalitarian. Either people are subjugated by force or people resist it and therefore the law loses all meaning and the state becomes important. Either of these are not very desirable outcomes. Yes, sir. So just to conclude, um, when we talk about religious contentions, there's a larger principle at play. For example, when we talk about the Sabri Mala case, while it was a one-off thing that didn't need state intervention in it, I think those who were supporting it came from a larger principle of women's rights. So keeping that larger principle in mind, when is this, how can the state effectively make use of its power and in what cases must it intervene and in what cases must it leave No, if sense? there is a violence caused or serious harm caused to the liberties and lives of human beings on account of heinous social practices, intervene decisively, immediately. Mm -hmm. If it's a, a notional sense of equality violated but there's no serious harm, then society is not ready for the change, build the social movement first. Let the demand come from society. Don't overuse the state power because the state becomes important and useless. So you are losing on both counts. You are not achieving the objective. You are not getting the people's consent. So what's the point of doing something It doesn't really work? It's like King Cannot. Remember the famous story? King Cannot, no, all his courtiers used to praise, no, you are such a noble man, you are all powerful, you are like king, you are like a god, you are divinity personified. Cannot was a wise man. So he knew his limits. So he wanted to teach a lesson to his courtiers. Mm. So he summoned uh, all the courtiers to the sea coast. And he, he got his uh, throne or a chair perched very close to the uh, water level. And the waves kept coming and touching his feet. Mm. He, said, he told his courtiers, no, I am all powerful according to you, I am divine. I am now giving an order to these waves to stop touching my feet. Mm. The waves would not stop touching his feet. So there are limits to governmental power. Use it wisely. 
don't use it recklessly. And the ratio to my mind is, when there is a real and direct violence caused to, violence doesn't mean physical violence, I mean uh, violation of serious freedoms and rights and subjugation of certain groups in the name of heinous practices of a religion, then stop it. Otherwise, let society find its ways and let society bring pressure on the state that we need this to be done. You don't take the initiative because the state becomes ineffective. And the worst thing you can do in a country is to make the state ineffective. If people ignore all laws and all rules, then you have anarchy. The very purpose of state is defeated. So too many laws are not a wise thing. Few interventions, few laws, but well implemented. And enacted with wisdom. That is the right course. Too many laws, all laws generally violated, is a terrible way of managing a society. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. I hope the viewers watching got a better understanding of this. Thank you.